Get Driving Taped by Leslie and Colin Smale. Hello. Because you've taken the trouble to acquire this tape, I know you have a desire to drive. And maybe, like so many others, you have witnessed driving from the passenger seat of a car and felt that one only has to do a few gear changes, a little footwork and some steering to get safely from A to B. Unfortunately, this is not so, for a new skill has to be acquired, a skill which comes reasonably easy to a few and with difficulty to most. Perhaps you remember your first attempts at learning to ride a bicycle and how eventually you mastered the art and riding became easy. There are no shortcuts to becoming an accomplished driver. It requires much practice in everyday road conditions. The object of this recording is to supplement any tuition you're having or intend to have from a relative or from a professional driving instructor registered at the Department of the Environment. By playing a particular sequence or maneuvering instruction over again and again, I hope to imprint it on your mind so that you will react more readily when faced with a given situation while in the car. Reference should be made to the relevant paragraphs in the Highway Code, the booklet DL68, that's your driving test and how to pass, and to driving the Department of the Environment's own manual. The right foot operates the foot brake and the accelerator, or gas as we call it while instructing, and the left foot operates the all-important clutch. The car handbook will show you the positions of the ignition and starter switch the indicators, the horn, light switches, wipers, dip switch, gear positions, and the handbrake. We must now adjust the driving seat so that the clutch pedal can be fully depressed and still leave you with a little bend in the left leg. Next, using your left hand and maintaining your normal driving position, adjust the interior mirror so that you have a full view of the road behind through the rear window. Check the doors are firmly closed and fasten your seat belt. Now, before we go any further, I must say a few words about steering, the gears, the clutch, the mirror and blind spot. Take steering first. Try not to grip the wheel. Hold it lightly at approximately 10 minutes to 2 on the clock face. Look well ahead where you intend to place the car and that way you will steer gently and follow the general ribbon of the road. Looking too close, that's just ahead of the car, will cause you to tense up and steer in a jerky fashion as you try to follow every nook and cranny of the road. Sit back in the seat, look well ahead, and pass the wheel lightly through your hands. Don't look at oncoming vehicles. Note their presence and look at your own road space, and that way you will avoid being drawn toward them. Figure 1 in Chapter 2 of Driving will show you wheel handling in detail. Now let us run through the gear lever positions. Usually the forward gear positions take the form of a capital H, with the reverse positioning forming a branch off the H. Having ascertained the positions, you should go through the movements of changing gear with the car stationary and the engine switched off. Practice until you can move readily to any desired gear position without having to look down. Make your changes with the movement of the wrist and the hand only, because if you use the upper arm and the shoulder as well, your steering will wander every time you change gear. And now the clutch. The clutch is a device for separating or connecting the power from the engine to the gearbox and thence to the road wheels. Basically, the clutch consists of two circular plates. One is attached to the engine and known as the flywheel, and the other attached to the road wheel drive through the gearbox. Power from the engine can be separated from the road wheels by separating the plates and transmitted when the plates are brought into contact. Establishing contact between a fast revolving engine flywheel and a stationary clutch plate attached to the road wheels must be a gradual process and this is achieved by smooth control of the clutch pedal with your left foot. Much practice is needed to master this control. When by raising the left pedal to about midway in its travel, 
you bring the two plates into contact, the clutch is said to be at biting point, a phrase which will keep cropping up from now on. And a few words on the mirror. It must be the easiest part of driving. You have only to raise your eyes to see in it. Yet it seems to be the hardest habit to form. The safest sequence of movements in driving is mirror, signal, maneuver. But looking in the mirror is not enough. You have to act sensibly on what you see in it. When about to stop, you must signal your intention early if you're being closely followed. And when about to turn right, you must delay your signal if, when you look in the mirror, you become aware of a vehicle about to overtake you. Never signal without having first used the mirror. And do both well before you act. It's mirror well before signaling and signaling well before manoeuvring and manoeuvring only when it is safe to do so. In particular, use the mirror well before you give any signal, alter course, make any turn, especially when turning right, and before you overtake, slow down, stop, or open the door. And of course, frequently as you drive along so that you're always aware of the position of following traffic. Finally, the blind spot. To establish in your mind the extent of the blind area, that's the rear view which is blocked by the pillars of the car framework, etc., note what is visible in the extreme right-hand side of your interior mirror. Maybe it's a lamppost or a driveway. And then look round over your right shoulder to see where the selected lamppost or such like is. You'll be quite surprised to see how much of the immediate right rear is not disclosed by the mirror. You must always look round before you move off, even though you have used the mirror. Before you can start the engine, you must see that the gear lever is in neutral and the handbrake applied. And if you will take these precautions, we will then be ready to start the engine by operating the starter switch and releasing it as soon as the engine fires. The engine should now be operating slowly, and this engine speed is known as tickover. You're now ready to go into the sequence for moving off, which we divide into four sections. One, clutch down, select first gear, release the catch on the handbrake, but hold the handbrake on. Two, increase the gas so that the engine buzzes just a little above tickover, and bring the clutch up approximately midway in its travel distance when it will reach biting point. At this point, the engine will slow down as the clutch bites. Now hold both feet still and move on to stage three, which concerns looking in the mirror and looking round over your right shoulder. And if all is clear, carry out the last section of the sequence, which is lower the handbrake and increase the gas as you slowly relax the clutch to the top of its travel. Again, it's clutch down, first gear, handbrake, catch released. Gas, clutch to biting, looking. That's in the mirror and over the right shoulder. Lower the handbrake and increase the gas as you relax the clutch. If all has gone well, the car is now moving away smoothly and you can put into the practice the points I made earlier about the way to steer. Look well ahead and pass the wheel lightly through your hands. If unfortunately the car is stalled, it was probably due to not having enough gas or too much clutch, or sometimes the delicate balance of gas and clutch at biting point is upset by abruptly releasing the handbrake causing a body reaction down to the feet. Do remember to lower the handbrake. Another cause of stalling is an unconscious relaxing of the gas as the right foot follows the left foot upwards in its search for biting point, thus losing the necessary power. Keep the engine buzzing while you relax the clutch to bite. You may ask about a signal before moving off. If you're moving off straight ahead and there's no one behind whose progress you would impede, don't signal. If, however, you're moving off at an angle from between or behind another parked car, 
Give a signal because this maneuver will take more time to complete. And though the road should be clear when you start to move out, other road users do come upon you at times and seeing your signal are then aware of your intention and can adjust their driving, if necessary, to allow you to complete the maneuver. But remember, the signal doesn't give you any right to complete the maneuver. So be prepared to allow such vehicles to proceed by waiting. Having got the car underway, you must know the procedure for stopping. Firstly, check the mirror and decide if a signal is necessary. If it is, give it in plenty of time so that a following vehicle can take the necessary action. Reduce speed by taking your right foot off the gas and then operating the foot brake with increasing pressure. Steer carefully alongside the curb and just before the road wheels stop, depress the clutch pedal to separate the clutch plates thus preventing a stall. When the car is stationary, apply the handbrake and put the gear lever into neutral. You can now take your feet off the pedals. Again, it's mirror, signal if necessary, off gas, foot braking, steering alongside, clutch down, and after the car has stopped, on handbrake, neutral. Depressing the clutch too soon means that you will be coasting or freewheeling to a stop, while pushing it in too late will cause you to stall to a stop. You should depress the pedal about two or three yards before the road wheel stop, and you must not put the gear lever into neutral or apply the handbrake before the car has come to rest. Do not use the handbrake to stop the car. Stop the car with the foot brake and apply the handbrake to hold the car stationary. The handbrake is provided as a secondary means of stopping the car if the foot brake system fails. It is also used in conjunction with the accelerator and clutch when moving off on a gradient. Now try a series of stop and go exercises so that the routine for starting off and stopping comes more readily to you. Do keep an eye on the mirror and signal if necessary. May I suggest at this stage that you rewind to recap. Having practiced moving off and stopping a few times, we can now move on to gear changing. As the car gathers speed, the need arises to change up through the gears in order to reduce the engine speed as the road speed increases. Rather than referring to the speedometer to decide when to change gear, listen to the sound of the engine. As it begins to race in a lower gear, change to the next one up. You will find that gear changing is easier if you decide in your mind where you intend to move the lever before you move it. Beginners nearly always have difficulty in remembering where the gear lever is, leave alone where to put it next. Try not to grip the lever. Use the open hand to press the lever sideways and toward the gear required. Let us go through the procedure for changing from first to second. As the road speed increases, you find the engine is beginning to race. Hand on the gear lever, don't look down, off gas, down clutch, gear lever pressed from one to two, up clutch smoothly and gradually increase the gas. Ideally, the gas and the clutch pedals are operated simultaneously. Follow the same procedure each time you change up. That's hand on the gear lever, operate the foot pedals, shift from two to three, operate the foot pedals. Remember, smooth clutch work means a smooth ride while rough clutch work means a rough ride. Make the clutch pedal slowly expand under the left foot. Most beginners take their foot off the pedal much too quickly, as though it were red hot, and this, of course, strains the transmission as well as producing a rough and jerky change. And now to changing down. The need to change down arises when, for various reasons, the car's road speed has been reduced. As for changing up, it's hand on the gear lever, operate the foot pedals, and gear shift from four to three, then operate the foot pedals. And the same again from three to two, if necessary. You see, if you don't change down as the road speed is reduced, the car will be unwilling to move on readily after you've negotiated the hazard. You have to look well ahead for hazards, which will necessitate slowing down and changing down. A hazard is anything which causes you to slow down 
or change direction. It may be a stationary bus or parked vehicles, roadworks, a pedestrian crossing or a road junction. Change down well before you get to the hazard. Slowing down means changing down. Try to get the slogan in your head. Slowing down means changing down. Let me just mention changing down when approaching a downhill junction. As you approach, your right foot will be braking, and when you come to operate the pedals, there is a natural tendency to release the brake, mistaking it for the gas pedal, as you press down the clutch to change the gear. This, of course, causes the car to gather speed, much to your consternation, as you approach the junction. So do remember, in these circumstances, to maintain the braking pressure throughout the approach as you depress the clutch to change down. Many hazards will cause you to actually halt the car while awaiting the road to clear. As soon as you stop, get ready to go. That's select first gear and hold the car on the handbrake as you apply gas and bring the clutch to bite. You're now ready to move on as soon as the road becomes clear. And try a stop-go exercise in a quiet road until you can stop the car and move on readily. It'll make you more competent when you meet heavier traffic conditions later on. And now to clutch control. Clutch control or slipping the clutch is necessary at times when carrying out manoeuvring in confined spaces or at difficult junctions. Moving the car forward a few inches in the garage or backing it into a parking space can only be carried out safely by moving slowly using clutch control. To practice clutch control, you should select a quiet road with a slight incline. Stop the car facing uphill and prepare to move off. Holding the clutch at biting point, release the handbrake quietly, making sure the clutch is just holding the car stationary. If the car tends to roll back, raise the clutch slightly, and if it moves forward, depress the pedal slightly until you achieve standstill biting point. From this standstill position, you should be able to move the car forward slowly if you raise the clutch pedal a little and think in terms of pressure rather than movement. Press and relax the clutch pedal around biting point to move the car forward or to keep it stationary. Be careful to keep the engine buzzing, not racing, while operating the clutch pedal. Otherwise, you will not have the necessary power from the engine and a stall may occur. After a little practice, you will get the feel of the clutch. But don't practice for more than two or three minutes at a time, as clutch and engine tend to overheat. A short drive between practices should cool things down. If you can do this exercise successfully, you should have no worries in moving off on a gradient, and you'll be well equipped for the car manoeuvres which we will deal with later. The emergency stop. The object of this part of the test is to see that your feet find the correct pedals immediately in an emergency and that you brake firmly and positively without locking the road wheels, depressing the clutch just before the car stops. If the wheels lock and skid, you should release and immediately reapply the foot brake pedal. The momentary relaxation of the brakes will allow the wheels to revolve, thus eliminating the skid. The maximum braking effect is produced when the brakes are pressed firmly with the wheels just revolving. Maintain a firm grip on the steering wheel with both hands. Don't attempt to use the handbrake as it only operates the rear brakes and any additional pressure on them increases the skid potential, plus the fact that both hands should be on the steering wheel. So leave the gear lever alone as well and don't give a signal. The responsibility for seeing that the road is clear behind you when exercise in emergency stops lies with your supervisory driver and with the examiner during the test. When he gives the signal, he will tell you what it is, he will probably tap the fascia, you should grip the steering wheel as you brake with rapid increasing pressure, then down clutch. So it's braking and clutch. Initially, you will need to do it several times to get it right. At this point, I suggest that you rewind to recap gear changing, clutch control, and the emergency stop. We must now move on to turning at road junctions. Turning left is somewhat easier than turning right, 
so we'll try left turns first. Any left turning circuit you choose to practice on will involve turns from main roads into side roads and vice versa. Take the main to side road turning first. Drive off in the usual way and as you approach the selected turn, look in the mirror and signal left. Keep left as you slow down and then change down to second gear, making sure you then engage the clutch so that you're not coasting. At the corner, your speed should be at its slowest, allowing you time to steer carefully around the corner following the shape of the curb, without mounting it or swinging out. Don't accelerate until you have straightened out the steering and given way to any pedestrians who are in the road and crossing. Then... On gas, cancel the signal and change up through the gears, making normal progress to the next turn, where the routine repeats itself. That's mirror, signal left, slow down, change down, steering to follow the curb, straightening up, give way to pedestrians, on gas, cancel the signal and make normal progress. Now to turning left at T-junctions. That is, turning from a side road into a main road. At this type of junction, you're required to regulate your speed in such a way that you can look right, left and right again and stop if necessary before emerging from the side road. In other words, approach at giveaway speed. That is, expecting to have to stop but being prepared to move on. Slowing down means changing down, so that at many blind or inclined junctions, you need to be in first gear a yard or two from the giveaway line and using clutch control to move quietly forward to increase your visibility into the major road and to proceed if it's clear. Where there is a stop sign or a red traffic light, you must, of course, stop at the stop line. If you're forced to stop, either by a sign or to allow the free passage of vehicles on the main road, or because the nature of the junction dictates that stopping is the prudent thing to do, get ready to go. Only emerge when there is a safe gap in the traffic from the right. That is, there is time to join the new road and increase your speed in the new road so that no driver has to change speed or direction to accommodate you. A word here about the danger from the left at T-junctions. Any parking opposite or nearly opposite the junction will put cars on your side of the road as they overtake the stationary vehicles. So you must be careful not to emerge into their path either. Again, you must also give way to pedestrians who are in the road and crossing as you turn the corner. And don't invite them to leave the pavement or a central refuge. And now to turning right. Again, select a suitable circuit in a quietish area and some of your turns will be into side roads and others from side roads into main roads. Let us turn into a side road first. As you approach the right turn, check the mirror and when it is safe to do so, give the right turn signal and steer the car to the left of centre of the road, that is, against the white centre line, well before the turning point. This positioning allows vehicles going forward to overtake on your left. Now, slow down and change down as you approach the turning point. Be prepared to stop at this point to give way to cars approaching from the front. When all is clear, make a right-angled turn into the side road, and this positioning will prevent you from cutting the corner, which is a common fault. Keep your speed slow until you have completely straightened up in the new road. Give way to pedestrians, on gas, cancel the signal and make normal progress up through the gears toward your next right turn where the routine repeats itself. That's mirror, signal right, positioning to the left of centre, slow down, change down. And at your turning point, See that the road ahead is clear before completing the turn into the side road. Then straighten up, on gas, and cancel the signal. The procedure for turning right 
from a T-junction is similar to the left turn, except that the road positioning is against the centre line, except from a narrow road when you're required to keep left. And although turning left has its complications, turning right is even more difficult, since you have to look for a safe gap in both directions before you can emerge. To take full advantage of an opportunity to emerge, you must continually look right and left, looking for the approach of a suitable gap in the traffic from both directions, and getting ready to go before the gap actually arrives. If you wait until it has arrived, and then get ready, you may find that you've lost the opportunity as more traffic approaches to close the gap. Be ready to take opportunities, but don't take chances. The importance of the earlier stop-go exercise comes into its own here, since you are now able to move out readily without the fear of stalling. Another type of junction we must deal with is the roundabout. Basically, it's a circular one-way street, with all traffic travelling in a clockwise direction. Unless road markings indicate otherwise, it is obligatory to give way to traffic already circulating on the roundabout as you approach. The rule is, give way to traffic on your immediate right. The rules regarding positioning and signalling are that when turning left, signal left and keep left, both on approach and whilst on the roundabout. When turning right, signal right, keep right on approach and throughout the roundabout, until you get to the exit prior to the one you intend to use. Then, signal left, check over the left shoulder before moving out to leave the roundabout. When going forward, keep left if you can and enter the roundabout without signal. Signal left as you pass the exit prior to the one you intend to take. So it's going left, signal left, keep left. Going right, signal right, keep right, and going straight ahead, no signal on approach, keep left if you can, and signal left at the turning prior to your exit lane. When in the roundabout, you must look out for vehicles crossing in front of you as they move out to leave. And now to crossroads. Although crossroads are of varying shapes and the approach can be level or on a gradient, either up or down, they fall into two categories, either controlled or uncontrolled. They can be controlled by traffic lights, white painted stop or give way lines, or by a traffic controller. Some quieter crossroads have neither lights nor lines and are therefore uncontrolled. No one has the right of way, so they must be approached with extra care and a willingness to give way. At the controlled type of crossroads, you must, of course, stop at the red traffic light or the double solid stop lines or if the traffic controller is signalling stop. As you approach a crossroads, controlled by white lines, you must notice whether you are required to give way or whether you have priority through the junction. In times of power cuts, traffic lights are sometimes out of order and this has the effect of making the junction uncontrolled, so you have to proceed with extra care. And do remember to give way to pedestrians who are crossing whenever you turn the corner. Some busier crossroads have white painted lines and direction arrows to divide the traffic into destination lanes to facilitate the flow of traffic. Select the appropriate lane as early as possible. When turning right, be prepared to wait well forward at the turning point for a safe gap in the approaching traffic before completing the turn. And this is the end of part one, and I suggest that you recap turning right and left before proceeding to part two. The box junction. A box junction has the road surface painted with yellow crisscross lines, and you must not enter the painted area unless your way through and the exit road or lane from it is clear. The only time you can stop on the box is when you're turning right and prevented from completing the turn by oncoming traffic. To demonstrate your ability to control the car in a confined space or in difficult circumstances, 
the examiner will require you to turn round in the road and in a separate exercise to reverse into a limited opening. Let me deal with the turn in the road first. You're required to turn round by means of the forward and reverse gears under control with reasonable accuracy and with proper observation. This manoeuvre is commonly known as a three-point turn, but if the road width is restricted or your vehicle is long, you can do it in five moves. You should be able to judge the front and rear of the car in relation to the kerb. The secret of success is to take your time, to move the car slowly using clutch control so that you have time to do the necessary steering. In simple terms, the manoeuvre is carried out by driving forward, steering right, going backwards, steering left, and forward, steering right, to end up facing the way from which you came. In more detail, it goes like this. Select a quiet, reasonably wide road and draw in close to the curb. Get ready to go. That's clutch down, first gear, handbrake, catch release, gas and bite. And when the road is clear in both directions, lower the handbrake to move slowly forward on clutch control and steer quickly to a full right lock and to try and get all the steering done in the first yard or two of movement so that you can now concentrate on your careful approach to the opposite curb. Get the car as far as possible at right angles across the road and when about a yard from the other side start to steer to the left then down clutch and brake gently to stop the car just before you reach the curb. On handbrake to secure the car's position while you select reverse gear. Now, release the catch on the handbrake, gas to bite, look up and down the road and to the rear. When all is clear, release the handbrake to move slowly backwards, steering hard to the left. As you approach the opposite curb, steer right and stop gently before reaching the curb. On handbrake and select first gear. When the road is clear, drive forward carefully, steering right, and settle the car alongside the curb. Initially, you can find out the moment your wheels are at the curb by allowing the wheels to gently touch. Now drive back about six inches and stop the car. If you allow your eye to run along the curb from right to left, you can note where it appears to meet your side window. And by using this reference, you will soon be able to readily stop the car six inches from the pavement. Similarly, you can do the same for the backward move. Remember, it is not a three-point turn. Simply, it's forward right, backwards left, and forward right. Move slowly, steer briskly, and look for other road users and for pedestrians on the pavement. Be prepared to be able to turn round either on a level or cambered road. On a heavily cambered road, your moves across the road will consist of moving uphill toward the centre of the road and after you've passed the peak of the camber, downhill toward the opposite curb. You have to change your foot controls from gas and clutch when going up the camber to gentle braking and clutch pedal depression as you drift the car to the opposite pavement. This is an ingenious exercise since it causes you to use every control in the car, the steering, gas, clutch, handbrake, footbrake and gear lever. It is designed to improve and demonstrate the car control necessary to manoeuvre your car safely in a confined space or a car park. Car parks can be very busy places with cars entering or leaving and people going to and from their cars so you must drive with extreme care while keeping all-round observation. When you can do a turn in the road, you enjoy the challenge. Your attitude to the one you do on your test should be, show me where you want me to do one, and I'll show you how to do it. Now to reversing. When reversing, you must be careful not to inconvenience other road users, and be ready to stop or give way to them. You should not reverse into a main road, or if you cannot see clearly, behind you. 
it is suggested that your first attempt at reversing should be driving backwards in a straight line. In order to get the maximum visibility to the rear, it is necessary to turn your shoulders and the rest of your body around to the left. This makes it more difficult to reach the foot controls comfortably, but with a little practice it becomes easier. Draw the car in alongside the curb about two foot clear and parallel with it. Turn around in your seat and then select reverse gear. Make a mental note of where the road or curb edge meets the lower frame of the rear window and with your right hand on the steering wheel at 12 o'clock, move the car slowly backwards using clutch control. Look well back the road and if the car moves in toward the curb, turn the steering wheel roadwise a little. Should the car move out towards the road, turn the steering curbwise. It usually helps to forget about turning right or left to rectify any steering wander. Simply move curb or roadwise. In the earlier stages of reversing, you will find that your eyes play up a bit and you'll probably feel cross-eyed or see double. But having got the feel of reversing, the next step is to try a reverse into a side road to the left. I suggest you try to do this in the first place using your own judgment, and if successful, well and good. If on the other hand you find it difficult, and most people do, the next part of the tape should help you. On the test, you're required to reverse into a limited opening either to the right or left, under control, with reasonable accuracy, and with proper observation. Usually, in a car with good rear visibility, this entails reversing into a side road to the left. And the problem here is that you cannot see the rear wheel, so you have to learn to assess its position in relation to the curb by what you can see out of the rear and side windows. Corners generally are of two basic shapes, square or round. The square corner will require a lot of steering to get you round it, and we'll deal with this type first. Drive your car just past such a turning on the left, stopping about two feet from and parallel with the curb. Now, notice whether the road is level or otherwise before and after the turning point, as moving down an incline will involve careful brake control, while uphill will require clutch control, and quite often a reverse turn involves the alternate use of each control. Now, select reverse gear, and move slowly backward toward the corner. Get your supervising driver to look out of his window, and when the rear wheel is about a yard from the actual corner of the curb, get him to say, steer in. You should immediately steer in rapidly to a full left lock, that's as far as the steering wheel would go to the left, and keep the car moving slowly back around the corner. As the car rounds the corner, and the rear wheel begins to close in on the side road curb, your co-driver must say, steer out. You should then steer out briskly to take out the same amount of steering used to get into the side road. If you steer out too little, you will hit the curb. Steer too much, and you will stray out to the centre of the road. When you start straightening out, you will probably get the impression that as the car is still swinging toward the curb, you're not steering the right way. If you fall into this trap and reverse your steering, you will no doubt strike the curb or even mount it. When you start steering out, say to yourself, steer out, steer out, as you turn the wheel to the right to steady the car parallel with the side road curb edge. And do resist a tendency to look and turn your body to the front as you steer out. When going backwards, look backwards and do drive slowly with clutch control. Having done it a time or two with assistance regarding turning in and turning out, you must now try to assess the right moments to steer without help. Try and note where in the side window you see the side road curb edge when he says in, and where it appears to be in the rear window when he says out, and use these positions as aids. Accuracy is not all that's required in this exercise. You have to find time to observe what's happening around you so that you don't cause the front of the car to swing into the path of an approaching vehicle 
or impede the progress of cars emerging from the side road. Do keep your speed low and be ready to stop. In new road construction, the corners take on a more rounded shape and require less steering to follow the curb edge into the side road. Generally, you'll find that you need to steer just before the curb edge is about to leave the rear window. About a half a turn of the steering wheel will keep the curb in view about six inches from the near side corner of the rear window, giving your rear wheel a clearance of, say, 18 inches from the curb. When you're well into the side road, a half a turn out will cancel the steering and put you parallel with the curb. A little assistance from your co-driver will again help initially. After you've straightened up in the side road, you're required to continue reversing reasonably close to the curb. The reason for this is twofold. A, to get you back clear of the junction for the benefit of other road users, and B, to see that you can do it. It is imperative that you move the car slowly to give yourself time to steer, or even make a mistake in steering, and still be able to rectify it without losing control of the manoeuvre. There is a tendency at times during steering to brace your feet on the pedals, thus upsetting the balance of clutch control and causing the car to reverse faster than you intend. Remember it's turning in and straightening out. A simple way to help you understand the steering problem is to take a bicycle, tricycle or kiddies pedal car onto a corner, maybe in the garden, and reverse it round the corner. The amount and direction of steering will approximately correspond to that which is required to carry out the reverse in the car. It is only with much practice that reversing becomes easier to do, and by demonstrating your ability to control and place the car alongside the curb, you are satisfying the examiner that you can reverse into a space in a car park, maybe alongside his own car. Try to treat the whole exercise as though you were reversing in a small area surrounded by expensive cars. Having detailed the way to start, drive and stop the car and carry out the test manoeuvres, let us move on to the other points to which we must pay attention. Your examiner is looking for a competent driver who handles the car safely with consideration for other road users and your observation of the highway code. You must also understand the principal causes of skidding and how to cure a skid when it occurs. You must demonstrate a willingness to give way to other road users and show anticipation of the actions of others. You must also know about tyre pressures, the maintenance of brakes and windscreen wipers. Skidding is well covered in Chapter 13 of Driving. The principal causes of skidding are the heavy use of the braking, acceleration and steering controls, combined with road and weather conditions. You see, on a dry road you may be able to brake quite hard and stop without a skid, but on the same road in wet or muddy conditions the same degree of braking may produce a skid. This type of skid usually produces a rear wheel skid either to the right or left. It is rectified by immediately releasing the brake and steering into the skid and then reapplying the brake with less severity. If the rear skids to the right, steer right. In every skid, remove the cause. Heavy braking, off brake. Heavy acceleration, off gas. Heavy steering, straighten the steering wheel. Tire pressures must always be kept at the pressures recommended in the car handbook. Incorrect pressures affect the road holding qualities of the car, both in cornering and braking, and any variance could upset the stability of the car. Brakes are so important that they must be maintained at peak performance at all times, and any sponginess in the operation of the foot brake must be attended to at once, as must any evidence of leakage from the brake pipes. The handbook usually shows how to adjust the brakes. Windscreen wipers must always be in working order since heavy rain or mud thrown up by vehicles in front of you impair your forward vision. Let me now comment on other points not already covered. You have to make normal progress and exercise proper care in the use of speed. 
and know the distances required for stopping at various speeds. Making normal progress means keeping up with other traffic within the speed limits and not crawling around in a low gear. It also means taking opportunities when emerging from junctions. Long delays at junctions waiting for the road to be completely clear in both directions is not making normal progress, nor is repeated stalling in your effort to move out from such a junction. In exercising the proper use of speed, you should always bear in mind that you should be able to stop within the distance you can see to be clear in front of you, at the same time taking into account the road and weather conditions. Paragraph 35 of the Highway Code says that one yard for every mile per hour of your speed may be enough clearance when travelling behind another vehicle. To help you memorise the overall shortest stopping distances, set out the following table on paper a few times. 2 times 20 equals 40 feet. That's the shortest overall stopping distance. 2 and a half times 30 equals 75 feet. 3 times 40, 120. 3 and a half times 50, 175. 4 times 60, 240. 4 and a half times 70, 315. That's 105 yards to stop. Notice that from your baseline of 2 times 20, every time the speed increases 10 miles per hour, the multiplication factor goes up by a half. Stopping distances increase greatly with wet and slippery roads, poor brakes and tires, and with drivers who are not fully alert. The truth of the matter is that most of us drive too close to the vehicle ahead. Keep your distance that's at least one yard for every mile per hour of your speed. Now to arm signals. During the test you will have to demonstrate that should your indicators fail, you are able to indicate your intention with arm signals. These are illustrated in the highway code on page 35. Give your signals early and positively so that others can readily see your intention. Really swing your arm when indicating left, and up and down when slowing down or stopping. Note that it's arm signals, not hand signals. You have to give the signal earlier than with indicators, so that you have time to steer while changing gear, and give the signal again if necessary. Following on to this, you also have to take proper action on the signals by other drivers. Be alert to the brake lights of vehicles ahead. A right or left turn signal nearly always means the vehicle will slow down or change direction, and you must adjust your driving plan to fit the new pattern. A very dangerous situation occurs when on arrival at a T-junction, you see a car approaching from the right and signalling left. You can never be sure he is turning into your road until he actually begins to do so. He may have made an early signal with the intention of stopping on the left, say at a petrol station, just to the left of your junction, or he may have left it on from a previous manoeuvre. At the commencement of the test, the examiner will tell you to follow the road ahead. This means that he expects you to take notice of all signs, road markings and traffic lights, and act promptly and correctly. Ignoring or missing a stop sign, a red traffic light, or a no entry sign will mean test failure. Keep well to the left as you drive along, except when overtaking or turning right. Most of the overtaking on test will involve stationary vehicles. Stay well out from them to allow for pedestrians stepping out from between them or car doors opening, or perhaps a car moving off without warning. In deciding whether to overtake stationary vehicles or obstructions on a normal two-lane road, give way to oncoming vehicles. By doing this, you'll find that you'll then be able to proceed with ease rather than trying to squeeze through and causing the approaching traffic to slow down or change course. When turning right, be careful not to cut across the path of closely approaching cars. Only cross if you can do so comfortably. If you think, I can just about make it, don't. Cyclists will cause you a lot of concern. You must allow them nearly as much room as you do 
in overtaking a car. Don't be attempted to overtake them if they themselves are about to overtake a stationary vehicle or vehicles. And now that you are a driver, you will notice that pedestrians' behavior leaves a lot to be desired. They step off pavements without looking, rush out from behind parked vehicles, or cross in front of the bus they have just left. They seem to look at your car, see the L plates, and stride across because it's only a learner coming. I'm sure that being a driver will make you a better pedestrian. Whatever the circumstances, however, you must give way to pedestrians if they are in danger of making contact with your car. You must give way to pedestrians who are crossing after you turn at a corner, and don't ever invite a pedestrian to leave the pavement. Maybe you're happy to wait for him to cross, but you're not responsible for the actions of other drivers. At pedestrian crossings, you should approach at a proper speed, that is, ready to slow down and stop if necessary to give way to pedestrians who are on the crossing. The white zigzag lines painted on the approach to zebra crossings mean no waiting, parking or overtaking on the zigzag area. You may of course stop here to give way to pedestrians crossing. Throughout any journey you have to look and think well ahead in order to anticipate the actions of other road users. When you realize what others are doing, you can then adjust your driving to fit in with the changing pattern of things. Without anticipation, your driving will lack smooth and positive progress. You will find yourself unprepared for situations as they develop, and this in turn will involve hurried movements and impaired control. Your anticipation develops when the control of the car becomes more like second nature. You have time now to notice things in more detail. Where street parking is permitted, be prepared for car ahead of you to stop just beyond a parking space to reverse into it. If the road is narrow, slow down or stop. Let him reverse into the space rather than trying to squeeze past him at the risk of his front scraping along your side as it swings out. When moving along in a stream of traffic, try to keep an eye on the vehicle two or three positions ahead. When it slows, stops or moves on, you will then be prepared to do likewise. If there is a line of parked vehicles on your offside in a narrow two-way street, Rule 68 of the Highway Code indicates that you have priority. But looking ahead, you see that a vehicle from the opposite direction has already committed itself to overtaking them, and there are no gaps in the parked cars. So you wait for it to come through, thus leaving the road clear for you to pass with ease. If you see a traffic hold up ahead, ease your speed. By the time you get there, perhaps it will have cleared. And many of the problems on the road are solved simply by slowing down. Read Chapter 5 of Driving for other examples of how anticipation can prevent possible danger becoming actual danger. In selecting safe places to stop, you should choose a place where you will not inconvenience or endanger other road users. The Highway Code, paragraph 97, lists many of the places you should take into consideration. At times, the examiner will specify where he wants you to stop. He is then responsible for the stopping position. And once again, let me emphasize the importance of using the mirror and checking the blind areas. You must always use the mirror well before signaling and signal well before maneuvering and maneuver only when it is safe to do so. Make it a habit also to look round every time you move off from stationary. Don't wait until a near miss or a collision occurs to get the message. And now a word about that most important but so often neglected booklet DL68, your driving test and how to pass. Within its few pages are all the requirements of the test and paragraphs 1 to 26 should be read and thoroughly understood as each of these form the basis of the examiner's report. He has to be satisfied with the way you execute items under control, your road procedure and your knowledge of the highway code. Do a few pages and signs at a time, but keep at it. In learning the signs, cover up the captions so that you learn them on sight as you have to know them on the road. If you can do all the foregoing competently, 
you're ready to present yourself for the test. If during the test you can convey your ability to the examiner, he will give you a pass certificate enabling you to drive unaccompanied. Let me wish you a successful driving test and safe motoring always. And thank you for listening.